Hi, welcome to another session of the Potter's Roundtable from Washington Street Studios, home of pottery technique and technology. I'm Phil Bernberg. Last time we talked about treasures in your backyard, the use of local materials. Today we're going to be discussing atmospheric firing. The atmosphere that they're referring to is the gases that are present in a kiln. Welcome to the Potter's Roundtable, a monthly podcast where we share our passion for the ceramic arts and a collection of topics specific to potters. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Enjoy the show. And just to catch up a little bit on where we are, in our overall program of understanding pottery, we've talked about the pottery making sequence, that was chapters one through six. We talked about the use of raw materials, that was chapters seven through 11. So we're starting the third section in our, in our, in our topics, which are kilns and firings, and we're starting off with chapter 12, atmospheric firing. So atmospheric firing, well, this is a word that's been used a lot lately. So we just, first of all, I just want to sort of explain what it means. When they're saying atmospheric firing, the atmosphere that they're referring to is the gases that are present in a kiln. So, and this is important, it, it can have a big effect on the pots because the gases, the atmosphere in the kiln, can react with the clay and glazes to produce different colors and different textures. And incidentally, they can also produce defects. In electric kilns, the atmosphere is basically normal air, that is mostly nitrogen and oxygen. And so this is described as an oxidizing atmosphere or oxidizing conditions. In fuel burning kilns, depending on how the kiln is operated, the atmosphere can vary all the way from oxidizing all the way to heavily reducing, depending on how the fuel is being burned. If there's a lot of air present in the fuel burning kiln and the fuel is being burned completely, then basically you can have oxidizing conditions. You essentially have excess air. If you're getting incomplete burning of the fuel, that is not enough air present, you end up with reducing conditions. And it's reducing primarily due to the presence of carbon monoxide. That's the active chemical agent. And the, chemical, the carbon dioxide reacts with certain elements in the clay and in the glazes to produce certain color effects. So for example, iron oxide or red iron oxide in oxidation in clay as well as in glazes tends to give you reds and browns and tan colors, whereas in reduction, it gives you black and in certain glazes, it can also give you a pale green. Uh, and the best example of that is the classic celadon glazes, the whole family of celadon glazes that are reduction fired. And the, the green is due to a, a small amount of iron present in the glaze. So there are two general features that you can say for, uh, that characterize atmospheric firings. They're generally, they're mostly done in reduction and they're done at high temperatures. And secondly, there, there are usually additional chemical elements of some kind that are added to the, to the atmosphere or to the gases in the kiln, and they, these produce new or special effects. There are really three types or three categories of atmospheric firings, wood, salt, and soda, and we're gonna talk about those in, in, in order. The, so this is sort of, be, sort of gonna be sort of an overview of those three techniques. In actually, let's talk about them in terms of historical order. So the first one is wood firing. Basically, wood firing really means burning any kind of brush or wood to produce the heat. And if you think about it, historically, there really was no alternative until the 1700s or the 1800s when finally the use of coal and oil and gas were, were introduced. But up to that time, everything that was fired in ceramics was fired burning something in the way of brush or wood or grass or something. And if it was high temperature, it was wood to get, in order to get the high temperature. So some of the features of wood firing, well, first of all, as I alluded to a little bit already, the atmosphere can vary a lot from oxidizing to reducing during the firing. And this is fairly common for the atmosphere to cycle, actually, depending on how the, the wood is loaded and the kiln is operated. It'll go from less reducing to more reducing to less reducing to more reducing over the whole term of the firing. The, there are chemicals in the gases that come from the burning wood that actually react with the clay and the glazes and produce one of the effects that's produced is called flashing. And this is where the chemicals that come from, the, from in the flame create colored patches on the clay. And this is a good example of flashing. This is the bottom of a tray glazed tray that was fired in, in, a, in a wood firing. And you, can, and you can almost see the direction of the flame being this way. These, these marks on here are from the wads, the, the clay supports that were used to keep the tray off the shelf. And so the flame came from this direction. 
I got, and it produced a little bit of glaze here, but all this orange color, this rust brown, that's the flashing produced by the contact between the flame and the clay. The color of the clay is basically a light gray. So this is all just a very thin surface coloring, and that coloration is referred to as flashing. So the, the, and the, so the chemicals in, that are coming from the burning wood and in, in the exhaust produce these colors. On the, they react with the clay and produce these colors. The other thing that can happen is that the ash that's from the, from the firebox, which is attached or part of the kiln, can get very easily carried. It's light, very light, low density, and it gets suspended in the gases and gets swept through the kiln and carried with the burning gases and gets deposited on the pots. And the, gash, the, the ash can land on the pots, and at low temperature, it'll just sort of create a crusty deposit. But if the temperature gets high enough, the, the ash can actually melt and create a glaze on the pot. The, what happens is the ash, which contains a lot of fluxes, reacts with the clay and actually produces a glaze on the surface of the pot. This is a good example of a wood-fired pot because it contains a lot of the different uh, things that can happen. On this side of the pot, this is just a little a gray stoneware. So the, 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 the color of the clay by itself would just be gray. But down here, below this line, this is more just of the flashing produced. There's no glaze here. This is just the flashing. Above that, there was a chino glaze. And so there is some also coloration introduced into the chino glaze. And then on this side of the pot, the pot actually received a lot of ash. So this is where the whole surface of the pot got splattered with ash. And the pot was fired at a high enough temperature to actually melt the ash. And, and, and where there was no glaze, it produced a glaze. And where there was a glaze, it melted and sunk into the glaze. So this is a nice example because it sort of incorporates all the different effects that you can get with wood firing on one pot. Um, finally, there are, there are different, one of the other variables, in, as I'm, you get, may be getting an indication that there's a lot of variation, or there can be in wood firing, and that's true. And one of the other variations in wood firing is it's fairly common for different kinds of woods to be used, different kinds of wood to be used, either by different people or at different times. And this is another variable, because the different kinds of wood burn at different rates, different kinds of wood produce different amounts of heat, and different kinds of wood create different ash effects and colors. Because as we talked about before, when we were talking about the chemistry, that the different, the different elements that are present in the, in the wood ash, like cobalt and maybe manganese, possibly a little bit of chrome, produce different colors in the ash, as well as some of the fluxes. One of the main fluxes in wood ash is calcium right here. Remember we talked about these first two columns in the periodic table contain the fluxes. Well, one of the main fluxes that the wood ash is, is adding when it lands on the pot, it's adding calcium, which reacts with the clay. And the clay is the aluminum silicate. We hope you're enjoying the show. Please take a moment to leave a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice. It really helps new listeners find the show. Don't forget to subscribe to receive updates as new episodes are released. And if you'd like to support the video and podcast production of the Potter's Roundtable, become a patron. Go to patreon.com and search for The Potter's Roundtable. Your support will help us achieve our goal of creating a digital library spanning the ceramic arts for use by educators and artists alike. Thank you for your support. Now let's get back to the show. Producing a glass. Okay, let's talk a little bit next about salt firing. Basically, what that refers to is the fact that literally common salt, table salt or rock salt, is put into a fuel-burning kiln. That's the basis of it. This was first developed in Germany in the 1500s. And at the, the work that, and this it was made for functional work, and the work that was produced at the time had this very characteristic gray stoneware color, and oftentimes it had a blue cobalt decoration, but it also had a very characteristic sort of bumpy texture, which we'll talk about shortly. The, the origin of the salt fire, I don't know that anyone really knows for sure where this practice originated from, but one of the theories is that, is that the Germans were burning old pickle barrels. And it kind of makes sense. If a barrel got to the point where it was no longer serviceable for making pickle, instead of wasting it, they could burn the staves. And of course, the staves would have become impregnated with a lot of salt. So it might have been an accidental occurrence, you know, where they accidentally put it in. And, they, and, and, then, you, and then from that, they, they saw the effects, and then it became intentional. So basically, Salt firing involves the addition of salt to a kiln at very high temperatures. 
And then what happens is the salt actually vaporizes and the sodium fumes, remember now sodium is a flux, it's a very powerful flux. The sodium that's coming from the salt in vapor form then moves throughout the kiln, reacts with the bare clay, and also can react with existing, if there are any glazes. So if, if there's bare clay, the first thing that it can produce is flashing, again, similar to this. Um, the second thing it can do is it can react with uh, it can react with the clay the same way the wood ash did, but a different element, and produce a glassy coating or a glaze in place. So here's an example. This is a little cup, and like that wood cup, this cup sort of embodies all the different things that you can get from soda firing. So this is, this is sort of the backside of the, of the cup, and this, the, again, this is just a light gray stoneware. So all of this coloration, there's no glaze below the, the, below the rim. All this coloration is basically the flashing again produced by contact with the soda vapor and also the wood. But then if, if you continue and you get a lot of sodium deposited and it continues to react with the clay, it actually can produce a fairly thick layer of glaze on the pot. It's black because this happened fairly early in the firing, so we also got carbon trapping. So while the sodium was reacting with the clay and producing a glaze at the same time, especially in a wood firing, a lot of soot is commonly produced, the carbon was actually trapped in the glaze. So I have a thick layer of black glaze. This, is not, this was not added. This was a glaze that was formed by the contact of the sodium vapor with the clay. And if there are any existing glazes on a pot in a soda firing, the sodium can have several effects. It can, because it's, again, it's a flux, it can flux the glazes that are already there and make them runnier. It's like adding additional flux to the glaze recipe. It can also have a bleaching effect on certain glazes, glazes that are high in iron that in just plain reduction might come out like some of the temakus might come out dark brown, tend to come out more of a honey color, tends to sort of bleach some of the colors. And finally, it can, they, the, the addition of sodium actually increases the crazing of the glazes. So a lot of glazes that come out of, of a soda firing, you'll find late after they come out of the firing, they can be crazed because essentially you've added additional sodium to the glaze recipe. And sodium is one of the prime elements that when present in large amounts in a glaze can result in crazing. One of the byproducts of salt firing is the fact that the chlorine from the salt, because the salt, remember, is sodium chloride, so the chlorine part of the salt goes right up the stack and exits this, and it produces really a poisonous, you know, obnoxious uh, exit gas, which is highly corrosive also. So that, is, that has been a problem always, the issue of, of possible air pollution coming from salt firing. But today, s people still practice salt firing, and it's used with both wood and gas firing. Okay, and the last one I want, we'll talk about here is soda firing. This is a fairly recent development because basically people knowing about the, the pollution problem associated with, so, with salt firing, they were looking for an alternative. And really what you, all you really want is the sodium present in the kiln. So they were looking for a substitute for salt and they found it in two materials. One of them is sodium carbonate, which is soda ash, and the other material is sodium bicarbonate, which is baking soda. And so these materials, either, either one of them or both of them, fairly, a lot of, fairly common to use both of them, either in solid form, they can either be as a powder or actually form little cakes and they're, and they're placed in the kiln, or both of these are very soluble in water, so they can also be made up into a solution and the solution can be sprayed into the kiln. And the nice thing about these materials is the, the only byproducts, instead of chlorine, and it, you always have the sodium, excess sodium going off in the stack, but instead of the chlorine now, all you have is carbon dioxide and water, the same as if you, from the burning of the wood or the burning of the fuel. So you've eliminated the, the chlorine, the, the pollution from the chlorine. You get basically the same effects from the sodium vapor um, that you do that from the soda firing that you do from the salt firing. There's a fluxing action on clay, if glazes and clays that are there. There's a bleaching of glazes, and you could also get the crazing effect. Um, but there's a slightly different surface texture, which is not as bumpy. This is an example of a salt-fired piece. And, and again, this was, this was a light gray stone red. So what you're seeing is a combination of flashing. But I don't know whether you can see the sort of, the sort of spotted texture on the material. That's the classic salt-fired texture. And it's, called, it's known as an orange peel texture. You don't get this same kind of texture uh, from the, the use of the, soda, of the, the sodium bicarbonate, the, the soda firing. You tend to get more just of a smooth, glassy coating, a little less of the, the bumpy texture. But basically, other than that, the effects are basically the same. 
And the soda technique, again, like the salt, is used with wood and gas. You notice in, in, in these last cases, I haven't mentioned using soda or salt with electric firing. You can't. First of all, generally, you, you don't want to do reduction in an electric kiln unless you're doing it in an enclosed space, some kind of a sagger. But also, the sodium would absolutely just eat away the bricks and would attack your elements and ruin your kiln. So both of these additions, the salt and the soda, um, are, are really confined to, to hard brick kilns and usually you know, gas, or, or gas or wood. OK, well, this has been kind of an overview of these techniques. We'll be talking a lot more about, about wood and gas and electric kilns in upcoming sessions in this chapter on kilns and firings. We'll be going through each one of those types of, of firing by itself. So I hope that this discussion has been useful today. If you enjoyed it, please like it and share it with your friends and other potters so that maybe our, it helps our videos get found on YouTube. We know that this was a lot of information in a short period of time. So if you want to hear it again, listen to our podcast version of the presentation. Search for the Potter's Roundtable on your favorite podcast platform. If you'd also, if you'd like to support our educational outreach efforts, and c consider becoming a patron and go to patreon.com and look for the Potter's Roundtable. Finally, also check out our website, www.hfclay.com. The next topic in the series will be wood-fired kilns, design, construction, and operation. That will be our next chapter under this heading. So thank you very much for visiting with us today. The Potter's Roundtable is brought to you by Washington Street Studios and our patrons. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe, give us a five-star review, and tell your friends. If you want to learn more about Washington Street Studios and shared studio memberships, please visit our website at www.hfclay.com. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time on the Potter's Roundtable.